Hey everybody, welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting. I am so excited because we really found something super cool, especially for all of you who are conscious about the environment, maybe you're a vegetarian, a vegan, we found answers. We are so excited and we are so excited that the CEO of Because Animals, Dr. Shannon Falconer, has joined us today. You are not going to want to miss this. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting. I am your co-host, Linda Hall, sitting in person beside no. my BFF, I'm kind and co-host, I am liking when it too. And when the snow hits, I'll let you know I'm on my way because I don't do Ohio in the snow. Uh, so well, I, for those of you who are keeping track, Linda's still at 11 and I'm still at 19 cats and counting. Although my yes. mom's trying to give me number 20. Yeah. I am resisting. Yeah. Her mother. So I, I don't know if you know this, but Dr. Shannon Falconer, PhD, was a microbiologist at Stanford with expertise in cell culture, microbiome, chemical, genetic, and molecular mechanism of now, action studies. I know studies. you're reading that. You don't know all those words. No, and, and I couldn't say it three <laughs> times fast either, but I'm very impressed. Let's talk to That Dr. was an impressive statement. Was, let's, let's bring her on. I know what, what is this animals all about. Yes, welcome and thank you so much for being with us, Shannon. Thank you very much, for, uh, Rita and Linda, for having me here. I know it's really fun to talk to you both. Um, yeah, so because animals, we're, we're making cultured meat, uh, pet food for cats and dogs. We're initially focused on cats and cultured meat is basically, uh, we are growing meat. It is not a meat alternative. We are growing meat, but we're growing meat in an alternative way. So instead of growing meat by raising and slaughtering an animal, we are instead taking some cells from an animal and then growing those cells inside of a vessel, like a bioreactor, the same way you would brew beer, very, very similar, right. um, and growing meat that way and then harvesting that nutrient dense mixture that is meat and then that will be our product for, for cats. I have to say how we found you was we had Dr. Katja Lang on our show from Made by Nacho. She was one of the instrumental creators in making sure the Made by Nacho food line is nutritiously sound. And I said to her jokingly, why don't they make mouse flavor cat foods? So Linda, exactly, yeah, digging on the internet. Yes. Guess what she found? Yeah, mouse flavor <laughs> treats made by because animals. Well, and the cool, I, I mean, I can't even begin like total that mind blown emoji fits in when you're trying to explain making meat that just blows my mind. But no, we're not, you, no need for antibiotics, no need for growth. But, you know, we don't have to worry about any of this because you just done grew it. So we're just like, and all yeah. these vegans and vegetarians that are just heartbroken every time they open a can of cat right. food you're giving us something we can give our cats that they're going to like it it's mouse flavored it goes right back to their nature you know well, and i'm sure there'll be other flavors too yes yes yeah so what we focused on you know we decided um when we decided that yeah, of course we were going to focus on cultured meat for for pet food um although chicken and, and beef and seafood those are the main ingredients in commercial pet food right. they're also the main allergens for our cats and dogs but people people feed those are included in commercial pet food because they're left over from the human food supply chain. So in culturing meat, we really saw this as the opportunity to actually grow the protein source that cats uh, evolved eating, which is mice, small birds, insects, and even small, small right. rabbits, baby right. rabbits. Um, and so I think there's rabbit flavor cat food already. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think there, there are, there is, yes. And it's, but, um, but not, uh, not a whole lot of it because the rabbit, Habit supply chain for human food is not very robust because humans tend not to eat a lot of rabbits. So yeah. really, as long as there's not a supply chain um, for human consumption, then it's not going to trickle down very quickly or, or in any meaningful way to pet food. Right. Um, so, so yeah, we, we, we're growing mouse um, for cats and, and the next cell line. I don't think any people want to eat that. No, <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Um, but yeah, but our cats do. I mean, even for, you know, as for those of us who have um, cats that are indoors and, and in eating, <clears throat> eating food, commercial cat food, I mean, gosh, I still, they still go after the mice. Um, yeah. It's just 
course it's instinctive. Um, whether or not they're consuming the most, they might be full because they've had their indoor, uh, their, their food indoors, but, um, but nonetheless, that drive is still there. So we were talking before we started recording, sorry everybody, but uh, we were talking about touring and all the things. So this is something, Rita's taking a nutrition course now and it's touched on a lot in the behavior course that we took, mm -hmm. um, you know, the importance of these nutrients. And we know a cat without taurine will not live through the lack of taurine. Yeah. So, and, but that is derived naturally by, and I don't even know if I can say all, but by eating body parts that are disgusting, right? because they consume uh, all of it and are like eating eyeballs and stuff and that's not in our food. So yeah. we're adding the, plus you said they're cooking it out, right? Can you explain all that with the synthetic? Yeah, Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll just actually, um, even just to say a little bit more about where pet food comes from. So basically, as we were talking about the, the um, uh, meat supply chain for humans, so 50% of an animal, uh, is not consumed by humans and that 50% it then is going goes towards pet food in addition to all of the other animals they're referred to in the industry as fallen animals um, there's another you can also refer to them as 4d so dead disease dying and disabled animals so those animals that don't ever make it to slaughter because they die during transit due to dehydration or suffocation uh, disease and so if an animal okay. dies before I'm it's gonna cry I'm sorry okay <laughs> yeah no but it's it's the gruesome reality of, of industrial animal agriculture and if an animal dies before it is slaughtered for food then that animal cannot be cannot be made into uh, meat or it cannot be sold for human consumption. So the combination of this 50% of the animal that humans don't want to eat in combination with these fallen animals or 4D animals, um, this is all sort of this very, very, very heavily contaminated biomass or carcasses that is, that is then sent to something called a rendering facility. And at this rendering facility, sort of all of this, this mishmash of, of carcass and, and meat is then subjected to very, very uh, high temperatures and pressures in order to sterilize that meat and to kill all the pathogens that have been living on the meat. But in the process of sterilizing that meat, a lot of the nutrients, in particular, taurine is one of them, especially those water-soluble nutrients, they're lost in the process. So yes, the irony is that commercial pet food, um, commercial cat food does not contain um, a large, I mean, taurine, some of the essential nutrients that cats need from meat that they would otherwise get from eating an animal in the wild, those essential nutrients are lost from the meat. So commercial pet food is, is it, it is a good, of course, it's a great source of protein, which cats do need, but we know that animals are not the only source of protein, but those specific nutrients like arachidonic acid, taurine, right. Vitamin D, those are added back to uh, cat food, and they're largely those are largely synthetically derived. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a bit of an interesting point because although um, although cats are not vegan in the wild, right? They do not eat animal. They do not eat plant based products. No. Um, but when we think about the commercial diets that people feed their pets, um, a lot of those essential nutrients are synthetic, which also means that there is an opportunity uh, to provide a, um, a food for cats that is nutritionally complete that comes from nutrients that don't come from animals. However, the challenge is making it taste really good. Um, and if it doesn't taste good, then a cat's not going to eat it. And as, as we chatted about briefly, you know, cats are not like humans, not like dogs. We can't just say, well, eat it or, or starve. They will starve. Right. And, and, and then really bad things start to happen um, very shortly afterwards. So fatty liver disease kits then, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's yeah. why I think maybe the popularity of the Rob diet has come up because those nutrients aren't cooked out, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not game for the raw diet. There's, there's, there's too many interpretations of it. I mean, I've seen people use the raw food frozen, you know, patties, and that's probably a bit better than I've had some clients that use just raw chicken. And yeah, they add the nutrients, and I just there's you know potential for salmonella. That's what it is. I don't feel like I know enough about what we'd have mm -hmm. to add in because as we we're saying, you know, it isn't just the mouse; it's the eye, the nasty bits that they're eating that are that are giving right. 
nutrients right. which are obviously not putting in our and food that processor. That doesn't address the humanitarian aspect. Exactly. Of, of yes. Producing food without it costing lives, which is yeah. where about because animals right. come in. And you're already doing a lot of this for dog food, are you not? So at the moment, we're still, um, so we do have um, some products on the market right now. No, no products made with uh, cultured meat yet. We are still, we're developing it, um, but we're now at the process where we're, we're ready to start scaling. But um, the products that we do have available are, um, we have a probiotic-based supplement, one for dogs, one for cats, as well as a line of um, nutritional yeast-based dog cookies. And the reason why we focused on uh, launching these early products um, that don't contain cultured meat, but contain other cultured ingredients that people are already familiar with the health benefits of. So, you know, we know the advantages of probiotics or nutritional yeast for both ourselves and for our pets. Um, and because cultured meat is this, you know, it's this new food that nobody really knows what it is. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to use these other cultured ingredients to help demystify the process because actually we grow these animal cells, these mouse cells in a way that's very, very similar to how we grow probiotics which is those individual cells, you put them in a, in a tank, in a, referred to as a bioreactor, which is warm and allows for gas exchange. Um, and so this is what would happen inside of a body. Uh, and then you feed all those nutrients into the tank and those cells consume them the way they would inside of a body and they grow. So, um, so the same way that bacteria or probiotics and nutritional yeast um, grow in a bioreactor, that's how we're culturing meat. So it's really not, it's not nearly as mysterious a process as I think a lot of people might think, just because it's, it's not yet available, but um, yeah. it will be soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And, I'm, and I'm sure, yeah, yeah we've got a cat walking across the desk who's like, <laughs> things, yeah. We were once doing a behavior session and he put Rita's uh, computer to sleep. Yeah. So I'm just oh, like, well, she'll be back. So anyway, and I just try to keep talking. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The way of oh, living with animals. But yeah. yeah, I'm sure there are some people who are nervous about that because there are people who will get nervous about all technology and anything mm -hmm. that we create. And, you know, you've got this yeah, Frankenstein. Yeah, about GMOs. And yeah, everything. and so you're, yeah, so you're, you know, Frankenstein in the laboratory. It's just not that. It's not that mysterious, right? And it's not. No, right. It's not. And I mean, if you think about any, any and all of our food, you, you know, unless you're growing, it, quite literally, unless you're growing your food, like you have an apple tree in the backyard and, and you're growing your own corn and, and you're growing all of your food yourself, um, any food that you, you buy from the grocery store, it is produced in by and large in a manufactured in a manufacturing plant and so the way that we are um, uh, similarly when we when we sell cultured meat based products you know that they won't it will come from a lab it will come from a manufacturing facility that looks very very similar to yeah in, in this instance like a, a beer a large beer producing yeah, facility yeah. Um, and I mean even when you think about um, uh, when you think about, for example, you know, certain types of chips, uh, like uh, nacho chips or whatever, um, this type or candies, right? All of those tastes, they were, they're all developed in a lab. Um, well, yeah. They're developed in order to make sure you have the right sensory experience that, um, uh, that is really going to appeal to the consumer, et cetera. So virtually all food is developed in a lab. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a bit of a mind shift. I get it yeah. because it's a food lab instead of a pharmaceutical lab. Um, and here we're sort of in this in between because it's, um, uh, because it's not yet a food. So is it a food lab? Um, but it will be a food. So, but you know, a lab is a lab. And um, so for our, from our perspective, you know, we're, we're developing this in a food lab and it will be manufactured in a food production facility. Well, and everybody wants to know where their food came from, right? Like this has been a thing for the last, I don't know how many years. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we're exposing how these pigs are kept and how these chickens are kept and how they're pecking at their own poo. And, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're really trying to get into where our food is really well, coming that from. That and the, um, the damage to our ozone. Yeah. Um, especially I Emissions. think cows. Yeah. Cow flatulence. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, you know, and then again, they're given the antibiotics and they're giving the growth to, you mm -hmm. know, and I yeah. was telling my daughter the other day that there was a time you couldn't find size 10 ladies shoes in the U S it was really hard mm -hmm. to find them. Now they're like eights used to be and 11s are easy to find. And there's, I'm starting to see 12s and 13s no, out there. I have small feet. Our feet, you have <laughs> tiny feet, but They're our eights. feet are growing. Like that used to be the average size eight. And yeah. I think it's like 10 now. 
Yeah. So things are happening right. to us, but well, and we're consuming the these too, growth hormones. They're, they're getting their menstruation they're getting their menses earlier. earlier. They're yes. Younger yes. Yes. Because of these growth hormones. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. so much of the chemicals. So I think we need to grow all our food like this. I think this needs to be something for everyone, but Ew. I'm so glad. Well, yeah. I mean, it's really, it's really interesting because it's, I mean, it, it really is just sort of this mental shift, right? And so we think about, ah, you know, it comes from the animal and therefore it's natural. But if you think about how these animals are raised um, and, and again, how they're actually um, how they achieve the sizes that they do achieve um, and um, through growth hormones, for example, and then with these conditions um, and, and then they're slaughtered every single piece of meat. Um, it has, this has been tested. That's been pulled out of a supermarket has tested positive. Once you streak it out on a plate, like a bacterial testing for bacterial load um, has tested positive for fecal, con fecal matter contamination of, of fecal bacteria, which makes absolute sense because again, the condition, under which the animal are, are kept and then they're slaughtered. In our instance, um, when we grow these, this meat or these cells in a, in a bioreactor, um, there is no feces involved, right? We know exactly what the inputs are, so we don't have to feed antibiotics, we don't feed these, these traditional growth um, hormones, uh, yeah. these, uh, yeah, the steroids, yeah. basically yeah, feed the cow or the chicken. And if there is any kind of contamination in our bioreactor, we can see it right away because there's no immune system, right? So where an animal has this immune system and it can sort of keep, say, for example, a, a, an infection, um, it, it's not always that obvious, um, you know, and, and of course, because the bodies are riddled, all bodies are riddled by microbes, um, but it's not always very obvious when, um, when an infection starts to set in. Sure. So, but in, in the case of growing cells inside of a bioreactor, it's very, very clear. And so at that point we can, okay, that culture, we are not going to use it. And so basically the point is that the inputs, the outputs, the sterility, everything is very, very, quite literally, it's very clean. Um, and there are no, there are no unknowns. Um, so although this is a new technology that isn't, it feels like an unknown, um, when you kind of drill down, it's far simpler and, um, and, and much easier to sort of understand the whole process than it is when we consider actually growing an animal and that complex series of events that happen throughout its life to the time it's slaughtered and then how the meat is processed after the fact, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Carts go into the cat and dog food. That's right. Even yes. The worst of the worst. Yeah, beyond. And I've always said I would not want to feed my cat or my human children anything that I wouldn't eat. Well, well, look right. at those cans because there's stuff in there you wouldn't eat. I know. Yeah. Right. You know, and gourmet brands like my Vinacha, you know, they have a higher quality of uh, protein going in, but not everyone can afford those foods. I sure can't for 19 cats, right? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah well, exactly. Where did you decide to choose the, the mouse to do first? How did all this come about? Right. Well, I mean, I, so uh, I grew up with three cats and three dogs, so not quite 19 cats, but, um, but I grew up with, I grew up with animals and, and they were very much my siblings and, um, and for, uh, ethical reasons, animal welfare reasons, I stopped eating meat in my early teens and then started volunteering with animal rescue shelters in my late teens and throughout my adulthood. Um, and then I was very, uh, very, very actively involved in TNR, Trap and Release, uh, with Cat Rescue um, in Toronto when I was working through my PhD. Um, and, um, and when I decided, I'm, I'm trained as a, as a biochemist, but when I decided, um, you know, really, I want to put my scientific career towards taking animals out of the supply chain mm -hmm. and i did think initially okay well you know i'll do something that's related to human food because humans are the main consumers of animal-based products but then as i started just to think about it a little bit more and then do more research and that well you know i i myself i i live a you know, very happy, healthy life without consuming um, these products. But, you know, where am I stuck? I'm stuck having to, to continue to support the animal, um, the animal agriculture industry to feed my pets. Mm -hmm. And so, and then, okay, but, you know, is it really going to move the needle? Is it, am I, can I make a difference? Can this make a difference in terms of taking animals out of the supply chain if we actually are just, if we're just focused on pet food? Um, because, you know, pet food is just the leftovers of the animal agriculture industry but just as we talked about 50% of an animal and all of these 
fallen animals, that amounts to, in the US and Canada alone, that's 25 million tons of rendered animal ingredients per year in Canada and the US alone. And this is worth, so basically with all of this meat, um, now as opposed to actually having to pay to have it disposed of as biohazardous waste, because remember, it's very, very heavily contaminated. Um, now the industry actually stands to profit, to continue to profit off of all this meat. So, um, so in reality, though, uh, the animal, animal agriculture industry, as we know it, could simply not exist in the absence of the pet food industry. And, you know, when I, when I actually understood it that way and, and looked at sort of the looked at, okay, well, you know, who's, who's, who's trying to do something about this then? Um, no one, no one really thinks about pet food. Um, yeah. So this is really where, um, this is really where I decided, you know, mo our attention is needed most at the moment. Oh my gosh. We have, we to, take, okay. oh yeah, we have to take a little break um, so that our wonderful sponsors can have a word, but we'll be right back with Dr. Shannon Falconer and Because Animals. And welcome back to 19 Cats and Counting with my wonderful co-host, Linda Hall, and our extra special guest, Dr. Shannon Falconer with Because Animals, yes. their mission to make pet products, pet foods healthier and without costing lives. That's the, that's the thing that's going to appeal to a lot of vegans and vegetarians and people like me that sometimes I open a can of food and I'm like, what exactly am I feeding them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, we're, um, yep, so that's exactly, uh, I mean, there's a whole, there's a whole series of reasons really for, you know, one to be interested in, in cultured meat, which is, um, of course, there's the, there's the humane ethical position. And if you don't care so much about that, then, then there's the environmental component, right? And I think, especially in the last couple of years, climate change for a lot of folks has, uh, I think the reality is at least started to sink in, um, that this is happening. And a large driver of, of climate change is animal agriculture. And then if people don't care so much about that, then okay, well, then there's the public health issue. Um, where do pan pandemics come from every pandemic in history has come from um, has come from an animal and that's just because typically viruses don't typically they don't cross the species barrier but when they do it's it's bad yeah. um, and so and when you have animals in very very confined conditions in very very stressful conditions so um, natural so they're defecating more because they're stressed um, and then there's with the stress there also comes um, a dampened immune system so um, so pathogens whether it's viral or bacterial can really take off in a way that they might not otherwise be able to and now you have basically this, this total perfect opportunity for things like um, viruses that are so virulent, they can cross the species barrier. So there's the public health issue. There's also antibiotics. 80% uh, of the antibiotics that are manufactured in the United States are sold to the animal agriculture industry. Prior to um, COVID, the WHO um, was saying, you know, in reality, the, the biggest global health crisis that we're facing is is, uh, is antibiotic resistant pathogens um, because uh, now you have instances where many, many folks who, you know, they go into a hospital for, they broke their leg um, and die because, um, because they acquire a bacteria that is resistant to all forms of antibiotics. And once that happens, you, you can't treat it. Um, and so, so people are dying unnecessarily in that respect. We have, we have a technology that is being really, um, it, it, it's not being used responsibly. So um, there's, a whole, there's a whole slew of reasons why every single person should care yes. about Even if you don't have an animal, right? Like, yeah. Right, I, yeah. Uh, I was watching pimple popping videos because I'm gross like that. Yeah. And um, I, it really I makes her ill when I do that. And um, <laughs> they had this, this one popped up and it was a cow that had an abscess. That was the grossest thing I've ever I'm seen. They like, yeah, plug your ears, honey. So they like slashed it and stuff. It, it wasn't, it wasn't as satisfying as a pimple popping, but my brain immediately went to this cow is a full grown cow. It isn't, oh, you can say, I'm good now. You can put your okay. ears and figures out. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. She can't handle it. But, um, 
So I'm thinking, okay, this cow is a full grown cow. I don't know if it's a milking cow. I don't know if it's going to slaughter, but it obviously has infection running through its system because that abscess was disgusting. Mm -hmm. And we're obviously going to give it antibiotics, right? And now I'm going to take these antibiotics because if I eat the cow, so I mean, this just, and the milk and the, yeah. So, I mean, it's scary and it all impacts us. And Mm -hmm. I know my, when my son-in-law was in the hospital a year ago um, with COVID, he developed uh, a bacterial infection. Then he got, I'm trying to think the uh, viral first, then, then bacterial, then he got a yeast and for a, yeah, yeast and fungal Mm -hmm. infection. Mm -hmm. They were Mm -hmm. throwing everything they could at it. They couldn't identify the antibiotic. He didn't, he didn't make yeah, it. He didn't make it but, <gasps> oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you know, gosh. Yeah. yeah. But, and I remember, yeah. you know, they called and they said, we have literally, they went to infectious disease and they said, we have literally thrown every antibiotic unless yeah. we could figure out the specific yeah. bacteria and have a special thing for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just, yeah. And I, I really do. I blame the food that we eat and, yeah. you know. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I mean, it's just when you just look at the numbers, so 80, 80% of the antibiotics and, and 75% of those are therapeutically relevant. So they're the same antibiotics that are used to treat patients in hospitals as they are to give to animals prophylactically. And, and by the way, it's not only that cow who has the, who has the, um, uh, the, the massive infection. These antibiotics are given to all animals, again, prophylactically, so yeah. without any infection. And they give them to them because there's this observation that um, animals tend to grow bigger and faster when they're given these small concentrations of antibiotics. Um, And this is the worst that you can, this is the worst thing you can do to propagate or promote um, antibiotic resistance because you're just giving small amounts. So now antibiotics or these bacteria, basically they can, they can quickly and easily develop resistance to these small doses. Um, This is, yeah. And then you end up in situations where you have super bugs, which invariably is, is absolutely what your, your son-in-law acquired. Um, and, um, and he, he shouldn't have died. Exactly. And then we're eating the antibiotics and the animals, right? So then we're more resistant to antibiotics when we exactly our bodies then build up a resistance just just like they're saying just like they're saying you know get covid you've got immunity it only lasts a little while but get you've got immunity yeah you your body learns to fight it well your body learns to fight the antibiotic right like it's like that's not gonna bother me i can overcome this is that how that works well, I mean, it, it's not even just about eating the animals. So whether, I mean, even for folks who are vegan or vegetarian, um, the issue is it, it's the most of the bacteria um, would be, it, it's in the feces. So, um, so of course, there, there could be. Um, now, normally meat processing plants will, um, they do or they're supposed to check for levels of um, antibiotics and they're supposed to be under certain thresholds. Um, I, 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 I don't want to speak to how, um, you know, to whether or not this is always observed. I'm, I'm not sure. But, um, but the point is that the majority of, of bacteria that, um, that come out of a cow, it comes out in the feces. And once it comes out in the feces, and um, now you have a situation where this permeates the soil. And once it's in, once the bugs are in the soil, it's in the water system. Um, so it's very, very pervasive. There's no way you can control this type of thing. So whether you drink milk or eat uh, flesh, um, it doesn't really matter if you live in our society, you, um, you are going to be subjected to um, yeah, these, these drug resistant pathogens just by, as a result of how society functions. Wow. Yeah. Well, and we saw, so Rita owned a um, cats only pet sitting service and I came on board as executive director the last four or five years in operation. And so when I first started, um, we had a couple of insulin cats, maybe one cat that needed sub Q. And then as we're going along, and then I remember when we got the first asthma cat and I was like, asthma inhalers for cats. I've never heard of such a thing. And we had had, I, we'd had one or two in the years beforehand, but suddenly it was rampant. By the time we closed the company, we had a lot of asthma cats and we had a Ooh. lot of needle meds that were necessary. A lot of needle meds because we had some sitters didn't want to do needles. So yeah. that would be like, oh, this cat turned diabetic or needs sub We got to find somebody. Three, two cats on needle meds right now. One's on um, twice a day insulin and once a month 
um, antibiotics. She's got something going on. And okay. then um, cupcakes on once a week, B12. Oh, okay. So, I mean, yeah. and, and the B12 became very um, popular oh, yeah. as well. I had never seen clients have yeah. B12 shots. And now I, I have to and do it. And we had many conversations like, where is this coming from? What's More happening? Cancers. And the cancer. Oh, my goodness. Everybody's mm. cat got cancer. At one mm -hmm. family, their cat died of cancer and they adopted another cat. So they were back to having two. And then the first cat that lived, he got cancer, like boom, boom. And I was just, mm -hmm. oh, well, those I'm poor people. If we go to these cleaner foods that you're developing, that we'll see mm -hmm. some uh, less disease in our animals and our cats and dogs. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say, oh yes, absolutely. Um, but given given what we know about how it's produced, sure. um, and you know, I think I think there's reason to be optimistic. And, and we still don't know. Of course, cancer is a very very complicated disease, and there are all kinds right. of reasons why why it can um, develop. And I mean, a lot of it's not even one disease, depending on what organ, so on and so forth. So lots of reasons, but definitely um, the the observation. I mean, veterinarians with whom I've spoke have said. Uh, you know, who've maybe only been practicing for 20 years even, and they've said the instance um, or the incidence of cancer has just sort of skyrocketed. And it's not known. Um, it, it's not, nobody, we, nobody knows how this, how, whether or not it's, these are, um, it's a result of the food or it's a result of um, uh, air pollutants. It could be any number of things. Um, but, but certainly uh, if we, if we know that we have, um, we have food that is, you know, again, we know the inputs, we know the outputs, and for those, there are a number of compounds that we do know uh, are cancer causing. Yes. And if we can eliminate those, yes. um, then I think, you know, that's a pretty good step. Yes, this definitely. Is Dexter, and I, yes, by the way. Yes. Dexter, <laughs> every time the microphone comes out, Dexter shows up. I'm pretty sure he wants to move to Hollywood and become a star, but I'm sorry. It's not in, it's not in your past. Sweetie. I lived in Hollywood but, for 10 years. I'm not going Yeah, back. not doing that again. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, and I, and I do, I do consider like, okay, this isn't great, but take the lesser of the evils, right? Take the best path, right? Like, okay, yeah. maybe I'm still eating potato chips, but I'm drinking more water and I gave up pop, right? So yeah. whatever yeah, yeah. we can decrease, I'm a fan. So Right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. So right now you're starting with these mouse cookies. They're like treats, right? Yeah, so basically what we um, what we did this past summer is we 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 basically created the, the the product. So you know we have these mouse uh, cultured mouse cat cookies. So um, and uh, and where we're at right now is we we really just we need to scale. So um, you know as the, as a startup we're very very heavily reliant still on uh, venture capital funding. So um, so with our next fundraise um, the the money that we raise from that uh, will be basically put towards building out our, our manufacturing facility, our first small scale manufacturing facility so that we can actually produce these, these treats in the volumes that um, we want to and we know other people who want us to. Yeah, we're dying here. I'm we're dying. Forward. I'm but, not 19 tastes. I, right, that's what 11. I said. So, but even though we cannot get them today, we can get on a list to be notified because I'm on the list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm on the list too, yeah. Where do people go to get on that list and to learn more about this? Yeah, so you can go to our website, becauseanimals.com, and, um, and we have, you can find there, we have a white paper, so where I've, um, some of the things and the statistics that I've, I've mentioned today, um, there's, there's just more in-depth information there, um, and then there's also, yeah, you can, you can join up to our newsletter to receive updates on both cultured, uh, the cultured products, cultured meat products, as well as other products, um, and if you're interested in, in um, yeah, trying any of our current products, you can also order from our, directly from our website, so yeah. Becauseanimals.com is a, is a good resource. Yes, and you have for dogs and cats. I do have a small dog too. I'm just a cat person. And and I'm like told you, I'm pretty sure my dog doesn't realize she's a dog because yeah. she's cats. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Even, I took a picture one day. She sat in the litter box like she thought it was a oh. or something. And I'm like, I told you, Rita sent the picture to her. This dog is confused. She yeah. doesn't know what she Oh, that's funny. Oh, well, we wow. can't do your dog food. So, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll have to get some. 
Yes, we don't we don't just feed her cat food with the cat. So. But yeah. yeah, and it's very it's very you're very good at explaining things in a not because you would expect that someone with expertise in cell culture, microbiome, all that stuff I said would be way above our heads. But you're not. You explain it very well on the site. You bring yeah. it down to to non microbiologist level, which I appreciate. I got a pretty good grasp of what you're doing without an understanding of all the great things you know. So yeah, no, it is it is simple at, at the core. It really is simple, and so um, so it's easy to explain a simple process when it really is simple. So when yeah, you, good. When you anticipate the first mouse treats to be available. Well, um, I think, so 2022, we're, we're really gunning towards that. Um, it will be, you know, we will be limited batch for quite some time. So um, we anticipate, okay, you know, making a batch and then selling, and then of course we'll have to go back and, and make more and so on. So uh, as far as continuous, you know, continuous availability, that will take some time because the entire cultured meat industry, um, not only because animals, but all of these other companies that are um, involved in making cultured meat for human food, um, everybody's in the same position in the sense that you know the technology the infrastructure I should, I should say is just not there for full-scale manufacturing um, but we're we're all getting there so um, ideally those initial limited batch um, uh, quantities will be available in 2022 and then and then hopefully yeah we'll only increase from there yes. do you and have then, like one mouse donor I mean how does this, <laughs> where do you get the start from? yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, great question. So, um, so initially, we, um, we actually, uh, from so mice, so three mice that would have other been used, otherwise been used for research purposes, we took some tissue from their ears. And then these mice went on to the, um, the company adopted them, and they went on to live um, with one of our research scientists in, in a plush mouse house in her home. And um, so, yeah, and That's so, amazing. yeah, so really, um, um, yeah, it's, uh, so that's where, and, and you know, it really is, so the, the little bit of tissue, and then from there, basically, um, once you have a sample of tissue, um, and depending on what type of cell you're working with, um, but for us, we're initially starting with stem cells, stem cells, which are sort of, if you will, the most naive cell in the body. It has, um, and, and those cells will continue to reproduce, they'll continue to double or reproduce right. indefinitely. Right. So we don't ever have to go back to an animal. But so um, once you got your little snip, you were set. Yeah, what once you that? have your, yeah. and. It does depend. I mean, it, that's not sort of as, across the whole industry right. because different people are working with different cell lines and it does right. get a little bit more complicated. But for us, we didn't ever want to have to go back to the animal. We wanted, okay, we're going to take the cells and that's it. Now we're done. Um, and you for your service and you can live your life. I love <laughs> it. No, fire. really, I love it. Like, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your service to man and animal kind and yeah. go live a happy life. Yes. So, um, so then, uh, yes, yeah, so now those cells will, and, and we can basically, those cells can become mouse muscle cells or mass, mice, mouse fat cells or mouse uh, liver cells, because as you said, you know, in the wild, the cat does consume the entire mouse. So different types of tissue um, have different nutritional profiles. Um, so, you know, we can, we can basically, so for example, the reason why, you know, when, when you, if, if folks just buy, okay, muscle, like chicken, a chicken breast and feed their dog or cat a chicken breast, it's not nutritionally sufficient. Um, not all of the nutrients that a cat or dog needs is present in just muscle tissue. So, um, so for example, but a cat that's eating an entire mouse, um, because they do need to also have the, 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 nutrients of the fat um, and uh, the various other nutrients that animals need and, and minerals, uh, vitamins, etc. A lot of these could be found in the organ meats. Um, so not muscle. Muscle is a great source of protein, but it's not a great source of really any of the other nutrients that the animal needs. So which is why uh, it can be pretty dodgy with the raw diet um, because you're not, you're not feeding um, all of the components of an animal that contain, and also the proper sort of that ideal balance of nutrients. Mm -hmm. And then of course the, the meat has bacteria because in the wild, especially cats, they hunt and kill immediately. They don't eat meat that's been laying around for X number of days right. post slaughter. Dogs scavenge more, but cats don't. Right, right. 
Mm-hmm. So, so you're not really going to need to add in, or are you, are you adding in taurine and, or is this like complete just from what you're making? So, um, actually we were really excited in our very, very early analysis. Um, we did see that actually there is taurine, um, without us adding taurine, we do see that the cells were, are making taurine. So it's, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. This That's amazing. is, this mm-hmm. is. Oh my god. I goodness. can't wait till this becomes commonplace and people have Me too. Yeah. Yes. So, like you yeah. want your ribs fine, you can have your ribs without hurting a cow or worrying about what you're putting in your body. I love some ribs. Oh, I uh, yeah. Well, we want to as you develop, we would love to have you back on the show, especially Great, as, thank you. As yeah. Um uh, available yes. to both cats and dogs. Yes. I know okay. um, my mom has five dogs, so she's We've got some taste testers there. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. Well, and I am assuming that after we get production really running and we don't have a problem with the supply of our mouse cookies, that we're going to start making food, food, and right. Yes, of course. That's so, right. Yeah. So in yeah. that. Yep, absolutely. That's totally um, 100% the plan. So initially, yeah, the treats because, um, you know, we can, we can include smaller amounts of the meat in the treat. But as we continue to scale, um, for sure, nutritionally complete foods is, is, is where we're going. That's awesome. Shannon, we are just so excited about this and we are so thankful to you. And we should mention your co-founder, Josh, because we're just cutting him out, giving her all the credit. But it's true. It's Josh, true. And Josh, Josh was also, he um, actually, we met when we were, we were both uh, active volunteers in uh, animal rescue in, in Toronto in particular. And so um, Josh had just finished his MBA when I, um, when I decided that I would leave my postdoc career to, to start, um, start the company. And so, we both both being very much you know dedicated to animal welfare um and we were both looking for a way to basically apply our our uh, expertise um and our trainings in a way that could um help other animals and the environment so Mm -hmm. that's when we um came together to start the company and Josh uh, went I, to school in Indiana, which is next door oh, to Ohio. So he got a vote that, for man. that. Yeah. So he okay. got, <laughs> everyone who's involved with animals in some way should volunteer at a rescue or shelter. For sure. And it's really yeah. a good experience and it really it makes you realize what's happening out there. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a huge difference for all of those animals. And I know it's, it's sometimes it feels because of course there's so much like, there's so much burnout fatigue, right. Or compassion fatigue, I should yeah, say. And it, a lot of it's, it's like a real thing, but, but um, you know, I think about, gosh, there's so many animals that we will never ever be able to help. But I then know. for the small, the relatively small number that we do, like, you know, they're it's life-changing yeah. so yeah. yeah which is why Rita has 19 cats because this that last is- one somebody you know she's 15 and she's diabetic and we're like hey nobody's she's gonna take her walking. yeah I saw Mimi walk through and nobody's gonna take her and if you take her to the shelter she's gonna get euthanized so sure. here she yeah. goes into Rita's house yeah. so yeah but she has her limits and she gets upset you know she's yeah and she's never gone over 20 and that's pushing that's it a never. little bit and she'd like to get below but then these cats keep popping up and I keep telling yeah. her can't save them all we can just take as many as we can take reasonably and still take care of them and then we segued off it's hard yes yes it's all related it's all yes and what you're doing is amazing because yes once we can get all these cultured meats out there less animals will be killed less animals will be kept in confined spaces Mm -hmm. you know nibbling i Rita's neighbor has chickens next door. Those things are stupid. They're beautiful, but they're stupid. And they just peck, 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 peck. And mm-hmm. you know, when they're back in their coop at night, you know, they're pooping on that floor and then peck, 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 peck. I don't want to eat that. <laughs> but we do. But we do. Yes. I don't want to eat that. So, I, have, yeah, I, have, this is... I have chicken ready to make for us. Uh, I'm kind of thinking, hmm, I know. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. Yes. Anyway. Yes. Um, any last words that you'd like to say, Dr. Shannon? Oh, well, no, I mean, I, only just to say thank you both for all of the work that you do for animals. Um, and uh, to what you do. Oh, no, it, it is. It is. It, it's absolutely, we're all in this together. I don't really see a difference, right? I mean, oh, I we, no, 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 I, not at all. So, um, yeah, I, I really, it's, it's very important that all of us band together in sort of this very 
big important mission and um yeah make just make as much difference in as many lives as possible i and mm. don't feel i'm overstating when i say this is really a game changer you are like literally changing everyone's lives human and animal apart so this is just so i was so excited and i reached out to you and i was so excited when you wrote back and i called rita right away and i was like she wrote back and he's gonna oh, <laughs> no no of course no thank you yeah yeah no, testers just waiting yes yes yeah. oh. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to for sure take you up on that, on the offer. Um, and because it's always really, you know, of course it's, it, it's very important for us to make sure as we talked about that, you know, the first thing for a cat, the first and foremost, it needs to taste good. So, um, so I'd be very, uh, yeah, we're, we're video we're, taste testing like we did with the movie. Yes, yes, yes. And we right. all know how finicky they are, but right. I think oh. mouse, I mean, that's not out there. They're, there's nowhere no. to get mouse food. So that's well, This is perfection. good because my cats can't eat. My, do my vet said don't feed them fish. Oh, and, yeah. And I had some fish left and I fed it and one of my cats threw up. And so. Simba immediately yeah. started throwing up. Yes. So uh -huh. They need a new flavor. They're sick of chicken and turkey. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. thank you so much yes. for coming on the show well, thank you very much you back yes again. dr please. shannon faulkner because animals.com mm -hmm. and uh, we'll definitely put that link in uh when this video goes up on youtube and also in the write-up on pet life radio linda as always thank you for finding such awesome guests for us mm -hmm. i I, I i had to have her <laughs> i had to have her <laughs> and mark winter who gives us the freedom to do whatever we want on our show and gives us this awesome opportunity on Pet Life Radio. Thank you so much, Mark. Yes. And just remember, it's not just Saturday. Every day is Catterday. We'll see you next time. Uh, I gotta stop the recording. Stop the recording. Well, he edits this part.